of, of the thinking of Hobbes here. Uh, because uh, if you go, want to go the uh, hard way of Hobbes and, okay, we should regulate, regulate, regulate this, we know that it's quite tricky to get that working in, in high corrupt societies. So even if you have regulations, we know that there is usually things to go around these regulations. So, so it's quite tricky to, to uh, regulate antibiotic use to some extent. So, so we have to think about other ways also, as I promised you, the Hobbesian way is not the only one. You can also think about other uh, attempts to, to study this, to, to, to do something. Uh, we can, um, I will uh, continue then with this second way of thinking about this <laughs> voluntary collective action. If it's difficult to get these regulations going, then, okay, what can we do then? Then, okay, perhaps we can make people to voluntary sacrifice to limit their use of antibiotics. So then we stick to another uh, important political science research, a more recent. Does anyone recognize the face of Eleanor Ostrom, former uh, Nobel laureate in, in economics? She passed away uh, a couple of years ago. But she received the Nobel Prize, uh, I think it uh, should be 10 years ago. I think she was the first and so far only woman receiving the Nobel Prize in economics, I think so. Uh, and she is a political scientist, Ostrom. Uh, she uh, is famous and very influential in, in uh, political science and economics. And why? Basically because she was brave enough to challenge Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the great Thomas Hobbes, uh, instead of taking for granted that the assumptions by Hobbes was correct, she wanted to, okay, is it really true that, is it really, really impossible to, uh, to um, uh, reach collective action without the state? Is there any circumstances where it's possible for people to come together without these third part Leviathan coming and forcing everyone to cooperate. So she has been doing a lot of research studying uh, uh, small scale collective action. She studied and found out that under certain circumstances, when you study, for example, how people try not to overuse local natural resources, fisheries, and things like that, sometimes they do actually come together, don't overuse resources. So that's possible. So that was the brave challenge of Ostrom, saying, okay, Hobbes, you're, you, you, you're wrong, it's possible. Uh, so in a way, she uh, challenged this standard rational choice prediction for collective action, the zero contribution uh, uh, prediction that people will never cooperate. So, so, um, so, so, so she made uh, an important contribution in doing so, but the thinking of Ostrom to some extent is, uh, is uh, it, it was of course very important, but it also had the limitation of being very focused on these small scale problems. In her career, she studied local environments and people come together locally. But in the later stages of her career, she wanted to think more about, is it possible also to govern large scale? collective action problems. When can people come together and do something on the larger scale? Because her theories and research was uh, focused on when people can communicate and discuss things in a small scale. But she wanted to, to think about small scale and going from small scale to medium scale. Uh, her research demonstrated that in small scale and medium scale, it was possible to overcome the free rider problem. But how about large scale? Many of the most pressing problems of today are not those small scale problems. It's not so much about trying to preserve fisheries in a lake somewhere. It's more of the global problems, climate change and antibiotic resistance, which are more or less global problems that will face uh, us all over the world. Uh, so the thinking uh, of Ostrom, okay, could we use this and use the learnings from the small scale and the medium scales to study these large scales problems? So this is, uh, this is the issue. Um, 
is it possible to um, to uh, uh, govern large scale collective action problems? And then doing so, uh, we have been thinking about some of these findings that Ostrom uh, made in the small scale, namely that certain aspect of human interaction called social capital is very important when it comes to collective action problems and people's willingness to cooperate voluntarily. Uh, and this goes back to another famous political scientist called Robert Putnam, who has written a lot about social capital. And his, uh, his, point, uh, his argument was that certain norms, norms of trust and reciprocity is very important because it can make people uh, come together and facilitate solutions for collective action problems. Uh, because these networks trust, they promote cooperation and promote norms for acceptable behavior. If you trust other people, if you know that people, other people will do their fair share, then that stimulates pro-social behavior and cooperation. And that was, as I said, an important finding by Ostrom in a small scale. And that has also been scaled up to a certain degree. And for example, research have studied the link between willingness to participate to, pro to limit the climate change, um, and how that is linked to trust and reciprocity. But then perhaps also this can be helpful when we think about people's willingness to do something personally to limit resistance, to do something for the common good for the future. Perhaps trust and reciprocity is important also when it comes to regulating AMR. So basically that was uh, the question uh, that me and uh, colleague here at the University of Gotham wanted to study in a paper we published some years ago uh, and we asked if features of social capital such as trust and generalized reciprocity can stimulate voluntary reduction of antibiotic use. So perhaps then you uh, wonder what about voluntary collective action? When is that a voluntary thing? So we want to have a test of this to test this using a scenario study where we wanted to see if people could accept hypothetically at least to limit their use of antibiotics so we set up this scenario experimental study where we asked people in a web uh, survey to to think about uh, a situation as you can read think that you suffer from a respiratory infection with cough, fever, and chest pain, and you have consulted a physician who prescribes antibiotics to you. But then the doctor asks you to wait as long as possible to collect and, and use the medication to see if the disease heals by itself. So basically, okay, you have a prescription, but okay, it's better if you, if you wait a couple of days, then it might heal. So then you don't have to use the antibiotics. So the dilemma here for the individual is, okay, perhaps the best for you, okay, go pick it up immediately so then you can get back to work in a few days. So you, perhaps it's your self-interest to do that, but also you should think about the long-term collective action problem. Okay, you have to do something with the collective, it's better to wait and see. Uh, so uh, we wanted to study this and link this to the issue of uh, social capital and in this case, reciprocity. So also, together with this uh, short uh, um, text, there was also information by the doctor saying, OK, you should know that uh, a certain amount of people actually wait a couple of days to pick up the, uh, the recipe and use the antibiotics. So we worried that factor. We worried the number of days the doctors say most people uh, uh, could wait. So one third of the people could read this story and say, okay, pe most people wait one day or most people want wait three days or five days. So we wanted to see if this reciprocal uh, relationship in a way, okay, if other people do their fair share, I can do it myself, uh, if that had an effect on the willingness to wait. So we, we studied this and as I said, we used this uh, three or one or three or five day manipulation 
uh, as um, in in the scenarios and the dependent variable, what we wanted to measure was the number of days that the people who read this think they would actually would be willing to to to, to wait. Uh, we also measured another aspect uh, of social capital, which is generalized trust. I also mentioned that this is part of the social capital literature, saying that like, if you trust other people, then it's also more prone to collective action. But remember, this is not manipulated. It's only a, a survey item measuring their level of, um, of trust. Uh, we also measured trust in healthcare to see if that also played a role. So in this paper, we looked at uh, the results and we found out, uh, perhaps not ex unexpectedly, I don't know, uh, but that at least hypothetically, this is a hypothetical situation. That is, of course, a limitation, but it, it at least gives an indication that if a doctor says, oh, people will wait generally in five days, then, okay, oh, I should do that myself. Yeah, it's better uh, to, to if I can. But if, oh, if doctors say people generally only wait one day, then the willingness to... Uh, the weight and postpone antibiotic use is substantially lower. And you can also discuss some other limitations in this, uh, in this um, paper, of course, but I think it's uh, to some extent interesting to see that collective action can be promoted if, if we know that other people will, will do something and, okay, I will, I will do my share. So that is important. But we also had some other variables, as I told you. Um, we also studied some other factors linked to willingness to postpone. And also we, um, we find out that both this generalized trust measure, I didn't explain that, but there's different between this trust in, for example, institutions, trust in healthcare, but the generalized trust item is trust in other people. The standard question would be something about whether people, most people can be trusted or so. Uh, and this uh, indicator, if you trust other people, then you're also more prone to, to, uh, to abstain or, or postpone antibiotic use. And also, you see that there was also a factor, a link between trust in healthcare and this willingness. So if you trust healthcare, then um, you can postpone. So these were uh, a couple of uh, years ago, but uh, I just also want to talk briefly about uh, a paper that was published online at least yesterday. Uh, so it's brand new research where we have uh, studied this more in detail. Uh, this is a paper by myself and a couple of colleagues all linked to CARE. Uh, so it, it's just... Uh, has published uh, where we study also the issue of willing to stay sick for the collective, with willing to do that. And we find to some extent similar results. We find that the acceptability of physicians' decision not to prescribe antibiotics is linked to trust in healthcare. If you trust healthcare, then okay, uh, I might uh, accept the doctor's decision. Uh, so that was an, an important finding, highlighting the, the important role of building trust in healthcare to, to try to solve this kind of collective action dilemma. So trust, reciprocity and trust in healthcare seem to be uh, important issues here. Uh, but as I said, uh, there is limitation when it comes to regulation, but also limitation when it comes to voluntary attempts to do this. Firstly, of course, as I explained before, these are hypothetical situations in a way. We don't fully know how people respond to this when they are sick. That's another thing. But the more challenging limitations is this. The map of trust is not evenly distributed in Europe and not in the world. Uh, trust is concentrated in a few countries in Northern Europe. Uh, in Sweden and Norway and Denmark and the Netherlands, trust is high. General trust in other people is high. Trust in this kind of institutions that are important in society is also quite high. Trust in healthcare is quite high. And lower in other parts of Europe and 
even lower though also in other countries around the world. And that is of course a limitation we have uh, to, uh, of course when it comes to AMR we have a, 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 at least presently a better situation in Northern Europe, but trust, both trust and corruption is prevalent, uh, low trust and corruption is prevalent in, in, for example, Southern Europe. So that is a challenge. Perhaps trust, reciprocity and these type of pro-social norms could help in a way, but it doesn't help us in countries where trust is low in the healthcare system or trust in other people is low. So uh, we still have problems. Uh, so I'll spend the last few minutes to try to wrap up this. Uh, I started uh, in the idea of looking at AMR from the perspective of the collective action dilemma, which also was, uh, was uh, discussed by Christian and Fredrik. Basically that there is a conflict between the individual short-term interest in using antibiotics and the long-term interest in the collective of limiting antibiotic resistance. There is a challenge here, also uh, a, a double challenge in a way, because it's both here and in the future, and my personal interest and the collective interest. So, so this is the dilemma of uh, AMR, the collective action, the large scale collective action dilemma. So then I discussed if it's possible to regulate this dilemma, going from the idea of hopes that people are egoistic, we need to do something to limit their rational egoistic uh, willingness to, to overuse resources. Uh, and we discussed the problematic side of regulating uh, collective action. This is, of course, not only a problem in healthcare, it's a problem in many areas when it comes to regulating large scale collective action problems. For example, when it comes to environmental collective action. But there is a, a quite obvious parallel between, for example, climate change and regulating the AMR issue. But both come with problems. Corruption, for example, and I discussed the link between corruption and overuse of antibiotics and the link between corruption and antibiotic resistance. So we said that, okay, regulations is good, but we have to think about other different ways of doing things to this. Is it possible to think about these other factors that we know from the political science literature is important for the small scale and the medium sized collective action problems? And we turn a little bit to the literature about social capital, the uh, literature saying that trust and reciprocity and uh, will stimulate pro-social behavior basically if there is a long-term collective action uh, problem, okay, people will be more prone if they trust other people to do something. And we actually have studied this in a, a few papers, seeing that we have this connection that's been seen in other also areas that high trusting people, people will trust in the system and trust other people. Uh, if they see other people doing their fair share, okay, we can do something, we can take some for the team and, and do something that everyone will benefit for in the future. Uh, but we also just mentioned the limitation. Trust is widespread actually uh, up in the Northern Europe, but we are an exception globally. Trust is generally much lower in other countries. So it might be difficult to scale this up uh, if people don't trust the system and don't trust other people. They will not be perhaps so eager to uh, to dig in and do something voluntarily to, for uh, for. Uh, uh, limiting antibiotic resistance. So in short, uh, we need many different political solutions. Regulations and information campaigns are important, but we have to kind of think about how to combine these in the best way to, to uh, promote prudent use of antibiotics. Basically, that was the end. So thank you.